Um, so basically what we're going to cover today, um, being on both sides of the, the fence that work both biomed and imaging, and there always seems to have been a divide between the biomed people and the imaging people. And I don't know why. Um, I mean, there's nothing spectacular about imaging in terms of, I mean, it's broken stuff. It's in a hospital. It's the same thing biomeds do. Um, I mean, you'll never get an imaging guy to understand what biomed does. I mean, that, that would be asking a little much of a true imaging guy. But I thought I'd cover some of my own personal experiences and try and um, take the mystery out of some of the medical imaging uh, for myself. When I got into the business, um, imaging was kind of a, a bit of a challenge. Um, I really didn't learn anything about it when I was in school. And the, you know, most of the guys that worked in it were kind of old and grumpy and they're like my dad's age. So the last thing I wanted to do was go over there and bug them about some imaging question. So I, I kind of had to stumble through understanding how this all worked. Um, and back in those days, we didn't have, um, you know, our phones or um, we didn't have Wikipedia or Google to, to look up what these things were. So um, a little different time, and a little different challenge there. But I like I said, I just thought, um, kind of pull back the veil on medical imaging and um, share some personal experiences and uh, give a little information um, for like someone that's in the biomed field that, you know, like walks into one of those imaging rooms. So I mean, that's a great big machine and most of the modalities um, do make some kind of radiation or process radiation. Um, so yeah, it is an intimidating thing and, you know, also can be hazardous if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so we'll go ahead and cover some um, topics and uh, then we'll take some questions here in a bit. It would appear that my uh, magic pointer is not working. I don't know, maybe I need to wake up the machine. Okay, okay here we go. All right, yep, just have to wake it up. So, class, it would be Biomedical Survival Guide to, or Biomed Survival Guide to Medical Energy. Um, Trying to bridge the gap between um, Biomed and uh, Imaging. Our first topic we'll cover will be uh, nuclear medicine. Um, for myself, my, my first encounter with medical imaging, aside from getting you know, like a chest x-ray or you know, stupid stuff like jumping my bike across the wall, stupid breathing, thinking I broke my elbow or uh, leg, um, most people would have some kind of a, you know, just general x-ray. So within my dealings as a biomed, my first department that I ran across was nuclear medicine. Now, in my mind then, and then to a degree now, anything that needs nuclear in it, you know, presents a hazard all on its own, and a, you know, a bit of an intimidation to, to go just walk into a department that's got that name associated with it. One of the main devices that they use in um, nuclear medicine is a gamma camera. Again, it gives me visions of the incredible Hulk getting irradiated with all these gamma rays. So again, I think I'm just walk into some room, which is probably not a good idea anyways. Um, so we'll go, go ahead and cover what gamma camera will do. So here's the actual first um, gamma camera that I ever did any kind of service on. Um, I used to do first call and we for a while. And uh, this is a Philips Skyline. And if you look on the um, sides here, here's the cameras. So you have a camera on the other side, camera on the other side. And um, walking into the room itself, you, you look at this thing going like, okay, it, am, am I going to get like blasted by the incredible Hulk? Well, what exactly does this thing do? And being a biomed, this is what I was faced with, not having any first-hand knowledge about what this thing does. It just looks big and scary, and it's in a place that's got nuclear in its name. So how a gamma camera works would be um, kind of um, counterintuitive to the name of the department. 
So basically what happens is the patient is given a dose of radioactive isotope. And so in actuality, the patient is the source of the radiation, not the machine. So here's a cut on the inside of the you know, gamma camera. And um, here you have this outside part here with all the little holes in it. That's the call of error. So this is the part that's pointing towards the, the patient as uh, they're laying on the table or couch, as they call it. Um, behind that is a um, iodine crystal that um, as the gamma radiation comes through the collimator, it strikes the um, iodide crystal and then creates a light, kind of almost like an image intensifier. So the radiation hits the front of that, it converts it into light. Well, then from there, um, the light then is recorded by these little hexagonal devices called photomultiplier tubes. And they normally come in little clusters of three. So this is what's actually recording the image that's made by the um, iodine crystal. And then from here, that, that's sent over to an uh, image processor. And um, through the magic of technology, it's able to um, locate the source of where the radiation is coming from, as well as the intensity of it, and make an image. One of the more common uh, nuclear devices you'll run into is called a SPECT or a SPECT camera. And that stands for single photon emission computed tomography. I'll have to say it one, one word. And here's, uh, here's another uh, device. Both of them are spec devices, so that Philips Skylight as well as this Philips Forte were both spec cameras. And so basically, what on um, this particular one um, was used a lot for. Uh, stress test so the uh, patient would get the isotopes do the stress test and then um, go under the camera and then they could do like a cardiac uh, output type analysis based on the um, where the isotopes were and if there's any kind of blockages in the coronary arteries. So as an evolution um, with the device um, now they have what they call spec CTs. So they take a SPECT camera that you would use in traditional radioactive isotope with, as well as using a CT scanner. So the advantage of um, using a SPECT CT is that you get the, uh, how should you say, uh, movement of the isotopes within the body so that you can get a picture of what's going on with the metabolism or the flow within the body. And then you have a CT scanner to then give you your spatial resolution as to where the anatomy matches it. So you can do it all in one shot. You do your, your spec scan and then move over to the CT and then you do your CT scan. Then that allows them to match the anatomy with the uh, function that the uh, spec scanner is on uh, information that it's giving. The next type of gamma camera or scanner that you'll find in a nuclear department is called a PET scanner. And it stands for positron emission tomography. Now, um, PET scanners um, kind of more or less do the same thing that a SPECT scanner does. The only real difference between them is a PET scanner costs quite a bit more and uses um, a different type of radioactive isotope. Um, that has a really short um, half-life on it. So for the type of scans you want to do, um, a PET scanner is kind of one of those specialty type things that um, maybe you want to follow up on um, previous scans done by other machines. Um, but like I said, with the um, PET scanner, the actual half-life is short and the machines themselves are very expensive. So chances are if you come into a new department, unless it's like something like UC Health has, um, you're probably going to run into um, spent um, cameras as being your first choice of machines that you'll see. So and again, an advancement of PET scanners as well as PET CT. And so what the PET CT will do is you'll have your, your PET scanner on the 
front and kind of by where the pillow is on the um, scanner here. And then as the patient's being scanned, um, then they will then go into the CT scanner behind on the back side and do it all kind of in one shot. Uh, this is due to the fact that the uh, isotopes have a really, really short uh, shelf life. And so you have to do the scans almost immediately after just three isotopes to the patient. But again, you get a better quality uh, image and get better spatial resolution um, in doing your diagnosis. And here's a story about a good old large river. So I was a junior just right out of school bio. And um, my manager handed me a work order. This is back in the slide of paper work orders. Those who don't remember. And uh, handed me a work order for um, a broken arm trigger down in clear medicine. So I'll be honest, I had no clues to what an arm trigger was. Really didn't want to go to nuclear medicine. And uh, of course, I break it to the balance. So they didn't want to look like it was a walk or anything else. Well, fortunately for him, he's a very wise man and he had me an ECT simulator along with my work work. So that at least gave me a clue that I was going to be working on something that was a patient monitor. So I can get into the med, walk in, go to the control room, hide in the file that I'm going to work on your arm and the tech just points through the window and says, yeah, it's over there by the couch. I'm like, all right, fine. Walk over in the room, and here's this great big gantry, all this equipment, collimators, all this stuff in there. No clue. Not a clue. So I'm standing there trying to do my best bravery. You know, like I'm in charge. I know what I'm doing. And this older gentleman with the deep baritone voice behind him goes, can I help you, young man? And, you know, that just about dropped me right off the spot because I got called out because he knew I didn't know what I was doing. So I said, I'm looking for your arm trigger. He goes, yes, right there by the couch. Luckily for me, I saw an ECG and it was hanging on the side of the face. So I was like, oh, yeah, there it is. So that was my, my first encounter in, in new men. So we'll go over what an arm trigger is. So an arm trigger basically is used on a camera. Um, I don't know if those of you are familiar with long pumps, and the arm trigger on those kind of works the same way. So what will happen, especially with like your um, specs, like you're doing like a stress test, um, you want the camera to trigger on the heart rate of your ECT. That way then you get some full picture of the heart in its you know, pumping state, so you can see the perfusion through the heart and going out to the body. So this thing is I don't know, not, not, much, not much bigger than a toaster. And it's got a little simple ECG uh, cable coming out the side of it. It also has a uh, connection in the back that goes to the camera. So basically what they do is they hook it up to the patient and then they're doing their, their studies that the archer tells the camera to, to take the picture now with the, the cardiac patient. It has a real simple Three lead ECG, so it was really easy for me to fix. I just wanted to do a set of leads, slap it on, and we're on our way. Here I thought it was Mr. I know everything about our trip. So sometime later, I get to DM for our trip, and I'm all full of myself, and I'm going, yeah, I'm our trip, and I'm going to the other, and I'm just being right on. So being the wise person that I was watching at the time, I go to the control room, and um, Talk to the tech and I said, Hey, I'm here to do PM on your arbitrary. And the tech looks over at me and she goes, Don't talk. Okay, um, I really mean, doesn't affect me if someone's talking, you know. So, that's more of a facility saying that, you know, we're going to make sure, you know, I can't work on that stuff. So I go walking into the, to the room and the gentleman with the deep baritone voice happened to be a ministry. The isotopes to the patient on the couch. And he turned around and said, You need to come back later to run So I'm walking down the hallway out of the department. I understood the part, you need to come back later. But the room hot thing is still still in my mind. Like, you know, like, well, why, why would I care if the room's hot? I mean, I'm just here to check your arm trigger. Then it dawned on me about the time I left the department. Oh, it's not that kind of 
So they were referring that the, there was three of them in Mexico. Right. There was a room in that. Yeah, it was a good thing, but I didn't go in there. And like I said, when the, the gentleman with the deep baritone voice told me, you need to come back later, that, that's all I need to hear. I was on my way. So, um, like I said, this is kind of my first um, challenges as a bioman working in nuclear medicine. Um, next item, uh, it's really not an imaging or a, a biomimic, it's kind of its own um, thing that I've had to work on um, in both roles, is the xenon trap. So when administering um, radioactive isotopes, you can either um, ingest them, inject them, or inhale them. So what the xenon trap does is it allows the um, patient to receive their dose of their inhaled xenon gas. Um, that um, allows them to do imaging um, via, via an inhaled uh, isotope rather than an exhaled or injected or ingested. So the xenon trap basically allows them to administer the um, isotope via the xenon gas. And then as the patient is um, getting the examination that they breathe through, it's similar like a, a circuit you can use like a ventilator or uh, anesthesia car, and they breathe it back in there, the xenon trap then catches those, um, uh, catches that gas and exhales breath from the patient so that you aren't filling the room full of um, radioactive gas that other people would maybe get to um, enjoy. Um, basically, what's in here, um, you have your part that you put your isotopes in, uh, give them to the patient, and then as they exhale them out, there's a uh, charcoal filter, like similar to an anesthesia machine, that would collect like the CO2 and the, the moisture. And then on the side of it uh, is a great big lead tank, and then the gas that gets shoved down in there, and then it's um, contained in there so the gas doesn't go back out into the room and for the rest of us to enjoy. Uh, unfortunately, with this one, I think it had been like four or five years since they changed the tank. And um, I had to go in and help them change it because it was kind of challenging for me to get the thing out. Well, my brand actually went through the roof when I got, when I got bad results. Next. Um, so I'm not sure how well that Xenon track is actually working at that point because it seemed like it was probably topped off and then some. But um, just in the event, you know, you get called in and you admit um, that that is a source of radiation that's not readily identifiable and um, might be something to keep in mind if you're working around the department. So basically in radiation, um, the radiation and the isotopes are um, processed through what they call the hot room or the hot lab. And each department will have one. Um, fortunately, they're pretty well locked down, so if you're not just gonna scroll right into the hot lab and go, hey, what's going on in here? I mean, you're gonna probably have to have a physicist or one of the tests like you in. So this is where they, they take the isotopes and prior to administration, they, they measure them and uh, get them ready to administer to the patient, mostly that they see intravenously, but um, you can't do the other ways. So a lot of this doesn't make sense to me particularly, but there is a dose calibrator and some other devices that help them measure the radiation and apply the right dosage to the patient. And then this is normally contained in a room with the other radioactive isotopes. And like I said, hopefully the facility you work at, it's all locked down, so it's not an easily accessible area for anyone like us. One of the devices that they use in um, the hot lab is called a dose calibrator. And those of you who haven't taken CRES, this is a question on CRES, at least the one I talk. So they, they will ask you what device is used to um, measure the uh, isotope strength of a, um, the strength of the isotope that's being administered to the patient. So I don't know if it's still on there, but that's, that's something that you can keep in mind for CRES. So here's a dose calibrator. Um, they're able to measure the isotopes and make adjustments so that they're not giving the patient too little or too much. Either way would be detrimental to their um, study and to themselves as well. 
And here we saw kind of a functional diagram. I apologize, the background might let me change it, but um, uses an ion chamber and a counter that allows them to then calculate how strong um, the dose is to the patient. So, uh, as I mentioned before, instead of having like an ionizing radiation source of mandatory normal blood, the isotopes administered to the patient is actually the radiation that's um, released or used in the um, nuclear medicine um, department. A lot of times they'll come in these little containers, um, break open the container, and then you're it's a sealed source. Um, one of my counterparts um, would use these often then to calibrate the machines when he was doing PMs. And they also contain like a, a brief major amount of dosage for the patients. Another way um, the isotopes are administered is through intravenous. So a lot of times they'll mix those right at the hot lab before they go to the patient, and especially in the pet lab because then the possible for just here minute and a half and others in like that lab are a little longer than that but you have to work quickly um so the, the a lot of times they'll mix them right on the side or the table side to get to the patient before they push them into the scanner so um, another part of my my adventures um that i had gone through in my early biomed career was um very first uh, MR system I ever saw was over at Lutheran and they put in, and I think after those things, it was only half a Tesla. So um, I had to learn all my trials and tribulations from um, that room there. So most of us in the, in the field um, probably get some kind of MRI um, safety training every year. As part of your, you know, like your personal protection, your HIPAA training, they normally throw in uh, an MR training. Of course, the, the main thing being is the um, possibility of having anything magnetic get sucked into the, the board magnet. So most people are aware that you don't want to walk in there with any ferrous items into the magnet, but there are some other things that you might keep in mind and when dealing around the MRI that are. Um, readily noticeable, especially if you're in a five-minute position where you may not work around this very often. Um, it does pertain to the equipment world. Um, in places that I've worked, um, most of the like MRI compatible monitors, like maybe Vivo Phillips monitors, uh, those little bed rack injection um, type of pumps, and then like the uh, batteries for the um, injectors normally live in the equipment room, so we'll have the chargers or the store back there. So you will come encounter with the equipment room, probably at some point, even though it's not related to what you're normally doing. So I just go over some of the hazards that are not as necessarily readily um, noted as, as the magnetism is when you walk into uh, MR. So um, the American College of Radiologists have come up with a formula. You'll probably, when you're walking around an MR unit, you'll see little signs that say zone one, zone two, um, that identify the particular strength of the magnet as well as the restricted access to the magnet. So for us, it's not something we really have to be aware of, but um, it is good to know that if you are, say, Carry a big thing of tools with a lot of ferrous ions. What zones you probably don't want to go in with that versus ones that you're not going to have an issue with. Well, unfortunately, my picture didn't come out as clear as I want. So um, basically, zone one is just any kind of public area. So this could be like, say, the hallway um, in the hospital that's just a general access hallway. Um, should have very little to no um, magnetism. In that region, and if it is, it's, it's negligible, so you're not going to have to worry about people with pacemakers or any kind of um, problems with public health um, in zone one. So the next zone um, is, is zone two. So zone two is kind of um, 
your first point of restriction when it comes to the public or unauthorized people. So here you have like the reception area, and then back here also you have the uh, kind of a changing and screening area. Um, so this will allow people to come in and do their business with the department, um, go back, change into their gown, get screened for any um, possibility that they may have any um, un unaccounted for metal objects, like a person that might have welded, might have some um, metal in their eyes, or any kind of, like you say, if you have a steel plate in your head, you don't want to necessarily go any farther than that. This allows also the uh, families to visit and send them off. So basically, this is kind of kind of still a safe area, if you will, get a little bit of an effect from the magnet. Um, typically, like around five gas, and then maybe just a little bit more. So again, nothing that's gonna like if someone's got pacemakers not gonna drop on the hallway or uh, in the uh, changing area. So the next zone after that is um, zone three. And this should be a restricted access area, even for us. So when we come in, if we have to do anything there, there should be a technician greeting us or addressing us and finding out why we're in that area. And this would be where your um, in vivo Phillips monitors would be, your little um, infusion pumps in like your injector batteries. So um, back here would be your equipment room. And this would contain probably the area where they keep a lot of the stuff back. It might be like on a table in the control room. So we want someone to know we're there and we want them to know we're there um, once we get into the zone three area. So this, this would be a restricted area. And then um, finally then is the actual magnet room. And unless you have a really specific business to go in into the magnet room, it's best to avoid it. That could be your, your source of your biggest risk or danger, um, just by the system alone. Um, myself, I avoid the magnet room like flight. I have my own reasons why. Um, I do have some physiological issues when I go into a magnet room, um, I can get dizzy. And when I get close to the, the bore, I almost pass out from being close enough to the bore. So there are people like me that do get infected, infected by, by the magnetism. So for myself, okay, I don't have to go in a magnet room anytime soon. I'm more than happy. But just be aware, only go in there when you absolutely really need to go in there and of course with permission of the department. So as we covered earlier, zone so one is your general public access. So your hallways and your areas around the actual department. Zone two is supervised. So you won't walk through there unless someone's there to escort you or give you permission to uh, be in that area. Zone three is restricted. So that would be like the equipment room and the control room. And then zone four is the most important. Tense. Uh, magnetism is measured in uh, police ones that are out now or in Tesla. So you'll see a lot of like 1.5 Tesla or 3.0 Tesla magnets. And that's the, the strength of the magnetic field that's within the room. One of the things that a lot of people are aware of in our, and but yet you probably are the most aware of them are the gradients. So inside the magnet core itself, there's um, other coils basically that um, help move the, the magnetic field around in, in study. So um, if they're doing say like a um, head or brain scan, um, they'll um, kind of use the gradients to make the magnetic field, a magnetic field stronger at that point. So they, they run in so this is the, the red um, is around. So the center part is the actual core and the magnetic core that um, makes the magnetism. And then the red wires around it will be your gradient wires. And they are uh, run in the X and Y and Z uh, coordinates so that they can kind of 3D move the magnet field around. 
as a real good example, depending on what they're trying to do. One of the newer styles of uh, gradients are these fingerprint style. And again, that center portion is the actual magnetic core, and then the gradients then are on the outside of the core, and then create the um, additional fields to, to uh, move the main magnetic field. So the three sets of gradient coils, um, nearly used in all in our systems, you have your X, your Y, and your Z. Uh, each coil is then driven by an independent power amplifier. So in that in the quick room, you'll find something that's rather large, part of this, um, we call the, the gradient amplifiers. So basically the gradient amplifiers are a pulse with modulating am amplifier. So this is what a gradient looks like. We go kind of run into some of the different there's different ways of doing it, but it looks big, bulky, and it's making a lot of noise and moving down the gradients. Um, also, what I've seen that what you're probably most aware of when you're in a large suite is you'll hear that banging and buzzing and that, that sound that, that you've heard in there. Those are from the gradients. So that's not necessarily the magnets making all that rap. It's the gradients are the, the, the noisy part of the uh, magnet in the system. Um, on each gradient, so these each one of these little boxes are the um, gradients themselves or the amplifiers form. So you have like X, Y, and Z. Um, one thing to keep in mind, we really don't associate high voltage with MRI, at least I know we did. And um, each one of these amplifiers can get up to as much as 2,500 volts. Uh, have a peak current of 1,000 amps and can reach temperatures of over 120 degrees when they're fully engaged and working. So, you know, I was an MR other than the cryogenic magnets, a fairly benign type system while I've been working around them, found out these gradients. And not only do they have a voltage on them, they're also very heavy because I've also had to help change them. So it's kind of like you need two men and a young boy to get one of those gradients pulled out at cabinet. Place. So, yeah, both voltage and um, weight. Not something that a typical biomed would be dealing with, but you know, just to be aware of that there, there is high voltage um, in, in, in the equipment room that you may, may not have um, took into account. Cryogens. So, um, in order for the magnet to work and to get a strong magnetic field, um, we use liquid. Um, helium to cool the inner core so that the windings inside the magnet are almost at zero resistance. And this allows the core to build up its um, high magnetic field. And like I said, most systems use liquid helium in their uh, cores to cool them. And you know, you might see this back in the magnet room. Most of the time, you can top off the magnet or refill the magnet. Company brings in the cryogens, tops it off, and then takes these guys away. But every once in a while, you might see one of these little guys hanging around. Um, the tech is, you know, willing to um, top off the cryogens. So I'm sure we all heard the, the the dreaded magnet quench. So this is pretty much the the worst case scenario that you can get in an MR system. Is having the magnet quench. Um, there's several sources of it. Typically, what it is, is um, there'll be a change in temperature. Uh, also, if there's like ice build up inside the core of the magnet, and that ice should have to break off, or there'd be a sudden change in location of the ice that can also quench the magnet. Um, magnet quenches are very violent, they're very quick, so you probably aren't going to get much of a warning. I was told that. There was somewhere between a five and ten second break before that goes off. Now, where that becomes a problem is if the um, exhaust on the magnet is either ice over or not working properly, the cryogens can come into the actual room. So, if you are suspecting that there's a quench on, either you need to get yourself out or your patient out rather quickly. 
Um, I've heard war stories from some of the texts about crashes coming into the room and pressurizing the room. Well, most of the bandit rooms open with the door coming towards you from the room. Well, if that pressurizes off, you can't get that door open. The room's pressurized. So below the window on some magnet rooms I've been in, it's been a brass um, bulking hammer hanging off the rope with the instructions that if that should happen, it would be unlikely to then kind of like a water landing. Um, take that hammer across the window out so that you can get fresh air and depressurize the room so you can get um, Again, those are some of the more stories that the text shared with me. So I don't have any first-hand knowledge of that, but um, just, just something to keep in mind if you're working in, in the bank, you might see where the hammer is. So the quench is a uh, result of the rise in temperature in the magnetic core. Um, I also found out that it um, can also be a result of like ice or any kind of large change within the magnet can cause the magnet to quench. And then thus resulting in the sudden uh, boiling off of the perihelion. Uh, some of the things that um, they do with the MR system that um, you're not familiar. Um, basically, what it uses is magnetism to, to uh, do the imaging. Um, it takes like all your hydrogen atoms and stacks them all, all in a row. And then, as your hydrogen atoms then go back into their original orbits, the computer is then able to decipher what type of an atom it's looking at and reconstruct an image from it. Um, one nice thing about uh, MR is that you don't have to like CT or cat lab or even Chet Brad, so you don't have to give them a bunch of radiation to do the um, imaging or get your image from. Um, works really good with uh, soft tissues, um, especially soft tissues with a lot of um, water in them. This uses um, hydrogen atoms, which water has lots of hydrogen in them. And um, the other nice thing, too, is that with um, MR, if the patient has any kind of uh, allergic reaction to your traditional um, iodine based contrast that we use in CT or cat lab, um, the GAD linear is a good alternative so we can still do a contrast image without um, worrying about being in the uh, reactive to the patient to the um, contrast. Uh, some of the sequences, so basically what they do is um, there's like two, two parts to the MR signal. We have the time to echo, and so the time to echo is one way that they're able to measure the signal and get their image. The other one is time to repetition. Uh, these are both done in different ways. Some have a longer time to echo, some have shorter time to repetition, vice versa. Um, depending on what type of scan, but that's basically in a nutshell how it's able to um, receive the signals and um, get the information from the scan. So here's um, an area that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I first got into imaging, um, working um, in the cat lab, and um, an honesty as a biomed, this is going to be your problem here most common area of that, like the OR, is to where you may get a potential unwanted exposure to radiation. We'll, we'll go over that scenario and work a little bit of the system itself. So basically, uh, most interventional and cat labs use fluoroscopy. I have seen others that use like a CT scanner in, um, in places like your traditional CR uh, cat lab looking system. Um, this allows the, the images to be viewed on a video monitor and um, are both useful for diagnostic and interventional procedures. So they can go in, take some pictures, and decide, well, yeah, this guy needs to go and get something done, or actually do the intervention right there and um, be able to diagnostic and take care of the problems. They have coronary blockages and go in and put in stents and, and clear the coronary arteries. So here's um, a typical cat lab. And um, so basically what I'll play the scenario is 
Friday afternoon. Always happens on Friday afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon. And you get a call from the Catholic. We have a patient on the table in our monitoring right now. We need you up here. Stay. So you hustle up to the cat lab, uh, run over, grab your um, bunny scoop, put on your head and foot covers, and you go into the cat lab. Well, you got your, your patient on the table, you got your cardiologist standing here, and you got all kinds of people frantically running around the room doing their part. You know, ideal situation is they let you go in, fix the monitoring problem of it's indeed in, in the room, um, which in this case is a math lab, and that would be the patient interface right there. Um, go in, do your business, get out, and then have them continue on with the procedure without you having to worry about getting exposed to any kind of radiation. That again, that just is not going to care one bit if you're in there with how lead he doesn't even probably even care that the monitoring system's gone down. He's got his images, and his job is to go ahead and clear those blockages in the heart because once he clears his blockages, the problem's pretty well solved. So you're probably going to start getting up with radiation almost the time you walk in the room because that part of the is going to be frantically trying to put his stents up into the coronary arteries. So here's the dilemma. Um, your goal is to fix either this, a lot of them will be on the table side now, smaller patient interfaces, and your x-ray tubes right here. Now, in my day when I was being taught about x-ray, no take this is gospel, this is coming from the old timers. The old timers told me basically you don't have to worry about any kind of scanning radiation or exposure once you're six feet away from the x-ray tube. Like I said, this is the old timers and that stuff. State, so don't take that as, as yeah. well. If you look here, here's your x ray tube. Now, even though it's pointed up here, so your beam is going through this way, you're still within six feet of that x ray tube. And really, you need to take that as being your, your safety zone. I mean, you, you need to be mindful that I'm in there, there's radiation, and I, I need to take extended uh, measures to protect myself. So here's the back side of the um, shank. And so right here is where the x-ray tube is. And then you got your digital detector. So anywhere, this, this is all combined together in one shot. So any direction that that detector goes, the x-ray tube will go with it. So you can have um, right anterior bleed, left anterior bleed. You can even have it with a bioplaner have a lateral, which will cover some of those shots too. So keeping in mind that the beam is going straight up, depending on what direction it's pointed, doesn't make, make it necessarily a risk that you're going to get a straight shot from it. That part of this type of system is, is you can see the x-ray tubes down below. So the x-ray has to go through the table, through the patient, and then it gets to the detector. Well, in that process, despite our best efforts to keep the vein intact and doing its thing all in one direction, the beam will then start scattering. So you'll have the, the sphere around this whole area that will have um, x ray beams going all different directions. Again, they're not as strong as the main beam, and they may not be as strong as the doses of beam that's getting. But it's still radiation. You know, I don't really want to get any more radiation than I absolutely have to. So as you can see, as I was talking about the oblique shots, so this would be a RAO shot, um, knowing that this is a patient left over here. So the beam's coming up through the patient and ending on the patient's right. That's how you can tell what side your oblique shot is. So the detector was on this side of the patient coming down this way with the left anterior oblique. And then the lateral, we got our next slide. Here's your lateral shot. Now, even though this is a single plane room, if you're to go into a biplane room, you'll have one plane that's doing the BP straight up and down um, direction. And then you'll have the, the 
the secondary plane um, will be doing your uh, lateral um, shot. So you could potentially have x-rays come negative 90 degrees from the patient. So um, another thing to keep in mind if you're working in a, a biplane room instead of a single plane room like this one is. And um, so here's an um, x-ray tube. I mean, most people don't get to see what's under the cover. So um, this is off of GE Adoba um, 2000. And um, here's your, your rotor and then your tube. And then up here is um, your collimator, uh, just to kind of give you a, a lay of the land. And then those covers then cover the, uh, the tube itself. So you don't get any fluids or other junk down in it. Before we go to that part. So um, getting back to our, our scenario where you're called up, they're having a cabinet procedure, um, everyone's scurrying around, cardiologist he's making it, he's just because he's trying to get this guy his coronary arteries open so he can get over his cardiac moment. So what do you do? I mean, you know, going in there, um, it's important that they have to do the training. Maybe not as important as the cardiologist, but the other staff to the training the patient in case, you know, they go into VTAC and perhaps some other unpleasant event. Um, basically, what you're going to have to take in your own mind and take away from this is that you and you alone are the only ones that are responsible for your safety around that radiation. Um, I had this scenario happen to me numerous times. And I finally went to the department director and said, you know, I'm getting blasted and I need to find a solution on how you call me up to your department to produce your stuff, but yet I'm getting exposed. Now for myself, the wrap around lens that the staff finally were more practical to, to just jump right in and, and get into the lab in a tiny manner. So I worked with the department, he ordered me, he came up with whatever lens I wanted. He said, here's the catalog, you pick what you want and I'll buy it for you. So I picked up a single front facing um, lens and then um, I would keep it at my little corner because everyone had their assigned spots for their lab or for the lens, like the cardiologist and the staff. So I had mine in my own corner, had my bunny suit, I had my head cover, I had my foot cover. So it would take me no more than just a couple of seconds to throw my lead over and I was ready to go. Uh, the only drawback to that is since it was only front facing, I had to keep my keep in mind how I was oriented to the uh, x-ray. So I always made sure I had my back, my my exposed belly um, side away from the beam so um, I won't get any more radiation than I had to. But just something to keep in mind, uh, same case scenario if you happen if you go into the OR, surgeon complains his integration system is not working and he can't see his whatever image up on the screen. You go in there, he's getting stuck, you can't bring that system that will be looking at the CR screens for his image and he's not going to stop until you get that system fixed. So um, another place you may want to ask for, get led for, would be the OR. So if you can call them during like an orthopedic case where they're using just a portable CR. Again, you're, you're covered, you got lead, you're protected, and um, you can go ahead and do what you need to do and, and leave and do it in a safe manner. Um, because it's not going to help you any going in there trying to be a hero. You, you're just getting blasted with radiation all the time. So something to keep in mind of. Um, and probably your greatest chance uh, is a biomed if you're going to get some kind of exposure. You know, this is a even if they call me into the room. You know, keep in mind that, you know, they're using radiation and there's no amount of your, you know, your that are going to protect me. It may help them, it may help that patient get into that case, but at the end of the day, I'm the one that carries the exposure. And, you know, Dan, it's true for you if you are, uh, you know, call in during the middle of a case uh, during a procedure. Uh, next thing is kind of a related topic to um, interventional Catholic, which is the hybrid OR. And um, hybrid ORs are kind of unique. There's not really one that's the same. Um, 
they, they become really popular in the past several years as procedures have gotten more and more, um, <coughs> should I say, less invasive than the, than the traditional um, the work procedures were in the past. So we'll cover some of the um, things that they do in the hybrid OR. So this is a robotic um, Siemens Zico uh, system. Um, it's in a OR, it's got all, uh, all the things that you need to uh, do a full blown OR piece in there, as well as giving you the um, option of having the CR and the imaging being right there in the room. What makes a hybrid OR a hybrid is that most of the rooms um, have this type of system that you have either a ceiling or a fixed or um, robotic um, CR in the room that will allow them to make images. And then you also have the advantage of um, if you can set up for anesthesia, um, kind of a drawback. It kind of reminds me of the old like stadiums they used to build back in the like, 1970s where you could play football, baseball, and do multiple events in them. But they really didn't work well. You know, you had, you know, football kind of worked, baseball kind of worked, but they never worked really ideal. So that's what was happening with cat labs. They were built as like an old timey baseball park, and they, they tried to kind of jam a football field in there with like the electrophysiology and some of these other procedures. Well, unfortunately, the cat labs weren't designed to have anesthesia parts in them. They didn't have the proper uh, ventilation of flow in them. And also, it came into question the sterility of the room. Most cat labs were not have a red light at the door going into the room itself. But the department's not red line by the OR. So, really, there's a straight shot from, from the control room right into the room past that right. So, as times evolved, um, infection control people and other people have said, you know, this really is not a good place to do these procedures. In. And since, since that's kind of been in the norm, now they've been building these hybrid ORs. Now, again, not all, all are the same. Um, ideally, if you're doing like cardiac or vascular type procedures, um, you would have a hybrid OR that would allow you to then turn it into a full blown CBOR so you can do a heart procedure or, or open up the vascular area. And if something goes wrong in your minimally invasive procedure, um, that's not always the case. Uh, but a lot of rooms are getting kind of built that way. Um, all the hybrid rooms that I've ever been in have been set up for anesthesia. So that's good. So, the, you know, the staff's not getting sleepy and they're not being exposed to, they, they run the uh, waste gas off the anesthesia cart into a converted vacuum. You know, but they have the other kind of controls for the waste gas. So having this hybrid room is set up just like an OR, so your anesthesia gases are being pulled out and it keeps the staff safe. Um, so, like I said, they can set up in a number of different formats. They can be a vascular hybrid room, they can be a neuro hybrid room, they can be a cardiac hybrid room. Most of the ones that I've um, dealt with have been a cardiac hybrid room like this. So, just to give you an idea how big that robot is, the picture does that's my early little hand next to the robot metal. So, um, and Siemens was so, so nice as to um, put a little hazard warning there that says possible pinch point. Yeah, I mean, really don't want any part of my neck anywhere near that knuckle when that thing's moving around. It's both fast and scary. Yeah, and it's super cool. I mean, it's really fun to, to, to drive this guy, but it is a bit of a hazard. You're not you don't know what you're doing. Um, on the, one of my pictures I put, so there's an Alaris IP pump sitting on top of the collimator and give you kind of a reference as to how big this thing is. Um, what's nice about the system is that both the collimator and the, um, so the collimator right here and the uh, digital detector can also rotate. So they can do some really insane angles and um, also the, the knuckle allows them to do a 3D spin. So they can do both 3D images and really tight 
hopefully shots that you can never get with any other conventional cat lab interventional system. Okay, um, so some of the things that they do in a hybrid OR include tabbers, which are basically a valvary aortic valve replacement. Uh, they can go intervascularly through um, like the you know, artery and go up into the heart without having to crack the chest open. And they can either put in a replacement, total replacement, or put a new one and kind of like mash and let the old one see so how like cut out a bunch of tissue and put it into the aortic valve. Um, another one that I've seen um, hybrid one that was a purely vascular one, they didn't do any kind of um, cardiac specific cases of their, um, they would do like their um, triple A's and their aortic dissections in there. And that was there and then if something should go wrong or they would have to crack the patient open, everything was there. The, the surgeon could go in and do their, their work with or without the, um, the x-ray. And uh, so that was kind of a, a nice option. I saw some really, really scary procedures in there. Um, one of the vascular surgeons that um, I've had to work with, guy must must be on the right hand of uh, some primary surgeons. He's done things that would, would just, I mean, are really, really amazing, both but also scary. Um, so, like I said, not every um, another hybrid application that um, I've seen more and more done with the hybrid or this electrophysiology. And again, electrophysiology up until the past couple of years has always been kind of an add on addition to a cat lab. So they'll take a traditional cat lab and put all their repeat stuff in there, and then they'll do the repeat cases. Well, with the accessing the pocket, with the pacemaker in, as well as other considerations, um, cat lab isn't exactly the best place to do those procedures. And so you'll see a lot of hybrid rooms now doing dual or multiple roles, including electrophysiology. Um, so this is just, just some kind of um, different things to keep in mind or consider. Um, electrophysiology is a very maintenance intensive department. So as a they can be called into those departments to um, you know, take care of cases with the EP equipment as well. Okay, so you have, um, again, your scenario, your traditional CR, you know, 90, OEC 9800 or OEC 9900, mostly used for like orthopedic kind of cases. Um, they also do use them in like system rooms in place of the traditional CISPA system. So again, it's basically, it's a CR just like the big cat labs and interventional labs, except they're portable. Um, you have the, you know, you have your tables. So um, just keep in mind that you make radiation. And if you get called in during an OR case, that you may get exposed. So to take the time to protect yourself and, uh, you know, Mr. I make way too much money, just wait until you get properly protected and uh, then you can go back to job uh, properly. So some things to keep in mind with radiation, if you're not in treatment or um, are not around it very often. Um, Time is your, um, when you're killing the less time you're around it, the less exposure you have, the better. Um, distance, again, like I said, the old timers told me when I was learning, they said, don't worry about it, it's beyond six feet. Maybe, maybe not. So don't take that as a gospel, but that's always their conventional wisdom. And then shielding, whenever possible, um, say like in a, or sitting, or like even in a cat lab, or um, say so you're in a, another area, if you're state time shielding where the control area is, or they have this like rolling plexiglass shields that you can go into the room. And a lot of times, like in the cat lab, what I would do is between shots, I run behind that plexi shield, let the doctor do his run, then run back over there, do my thing, run back behind the shield. You know, not my kill, but hey, it was better than nothing. And um, thank you everyone for uh, coming out and checking out the presentation. Uh, thank you to the Expo and Cabinet for 
sponsoring this. It's been nice to get out and see people, you know, rather than being secluded in our whole caves. Um, it's to open it up to any questions or uh, anything, any comments anyone might have. Uh, I got you in. Uh, what do we do for our biomedics? Like, what do you think? The biggest thing I found that's beneficial for them is showing how to call their things. Yes, yeah, some specifics of how to class. Right, different collimators are different methodologies and effects. And just getting that, I think, is a big thing for biomedics to know. On a weekend, if they're on my collimator, they'll say, I can't do this type of collimator. <laughs> but so yeah, so that's that's a big thing we do. That's one of the simple things that you can be able to do real quick in sure. which way you can check your exposure fields and stuff. You know, we draw that and I agree we used to do that too. We can go down and on call and go change the call variables to like an explore or like a little simple wrapper. Um unfortunately here in Colorado, um anyone that worked on a piece of energy equipment has to be licensed by the state. And they consider the call meter ball as part of the meal for you. And so if you're in there taking the call meter ball, you don't do it right, you could skew your meal for you. I mean, hopefully your text. Well, that's what we show about it. But yeah, we, we used to do that. And of course, we we'll kind of back off on that because the state rates you know, came and said, it. yeah. Um, but no, it, it does, um, some systems can mess up your meal for you. But no, I agree. They can fix up that like our balloon pump or anesthesia carpets call me a ball pump. But our you know, beloved government is uh, taking that unfortunately away from us. So it's an imaging call when the call meter goes out, um, at least when I'm on call. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I have no issue with it, but uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Okay, we have some fun to take a whole fix it themselves. <laughs> Yeah, uh, unfortunately not here, so you know, don't want to upset the nanny um, state. Uh, anything else, or Fred, one thing I was going to say when you were talking about the uh, wrenching of the magnet, mm -hmm. um, I saw it before where we had a central utility plant where we got chilled water from, and the chillers went out, or their pumps went out, or they weren't supplying them out of water. <laughs> And you know, the first thing you notice is the temperature of the room, you know, it's hotter in there. But then they started getting temperature alarms on their MRI. And then they weren't, you know, like they could, they could only get to a certain point. And I guess at that point, the, the technology, the safeguards in there cut it off, like you can't do any more MRI. You know, and the people, the, the MRI techs were freaking out. You know, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, you, uh, you can't do anything. It's not, you know, it's a water supply from the building. It's not. This, you know, we were calling the like Phillips or whatever it was, you know, what, what can we do? And they said, just keep working because we had patients that were under anesthesia and said, well, we're all children. So those patients are under anesthesia and they can't like pull them out and go, oh, sorry, you know, we're going to have to put you back another time. And you don't want it. And that's the side kid didn't want to have to. But the Phillips guy said, keep running it, it'll cut off when it gets to whatever temperature it is. And luckily, it came, you know, the chillers started working and they started pumping whatever the gallons per hour is that they normally put out. It was like a quarter of whatever it normally was. And once it started pumping and everything started getting back to normal, even like the computer closets, you know, that where all that, all that, like those big cabinets that were showing where the amplifiers were, <laughs> were getting hot, you know, and then over temperature. But it's like one of those things that you don't really ever think of until it happens, you know, and you're like, oh. Just taking out the chilled water in hospital can like take deadline almost the whole place. We had a um, system on the one side I worked on. We had a, a bypass that so put it on city water. So I get a call from the gals uh, from uh, in water and they say, yeah, we got that error again, or it's showing it's over 10. And I go in there and I can see like I said, the chilled water wasn't working, so there's a big valve and turn it over and run it off the city water. Like I said, it wasn't ideal. You know, obviously it wasn't as cold as the chilled water, but it still was pushing the water through the system. Um, CT was the same thing, like, and they have little float valves in there, and you can see where it's floating at and what, what it's reading. The same with MRI, they have the float valves back in that mm -hmm. closet that you're talking about, you're talking about the zone, you saw the closet on there. But yeah, I never thought that I could, I could 
Like us. Yeah, yeah I knew different know. systems. I was just like, whoa, just, you want to take out a hospital, just take out the water. So the same thing when they get a leak or something. They all we shot their own chiller. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is like a central plant that ran up more chilled water. Yeah, no, I mean, to UC also. It happens more often than not. I mean, I don't know how many times I've gone up there, probably two, three times a month, having to put it city oh, bypass. Wow. So I got quite familiar with it. Like I said, I saw the phone with Doc Stevens or Phillips, and I'd be like, and, and they'd be like, yeah, just go back there and find this great big valve, and one will say chill water, and one will say city water. It's like, pop it over to the other state. They just kind of have a computer system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They said, I'm on my way. Because that was his biggest concern. It's going to quench. You know, yeah. Like, oh, it's going to quench. Yeah. And that's and like, I was going to have a right like, It's going to quench the bank. You know, and, and really there's a lot of safeguards built in there before it quenches. Right. Now the tech would say, hey, look, I'm on my way. Tell them to keep using it. Just put it in on uh, city water and they'll be fine. And I never did have, you know, one, one have any serious issues. So, you know, that's, that's what the plan is. Actually, I have a question. Sure. Um, that, that, uh, the particular hospital that's having problems with their uh, MRI and the like helium boiling off at a faster rate, what was causing that? I don't know. I don't know. It's because it was the level. Like maybe it was at a certain critical level where it gave more room to boil off than if it was like filled up to its. Um, like I said, I, I did like first call MR and you know, did, did my best to understand, but. By no means do I have any like you know serious hands-on you know, or personal experience. I just threw that in there based on my own violin knowledge of having to go in there and do stuff with anything without being about you know kind of that uncomfortable feeling that you're the only person there and it's that critical the system you might have to go go jump on it and you know kind of just give up heads up that this, this is where the stuff lives and where it comes. Go to the like cryogen on the new systems. There's a lot less healing like the order of the amount that they used to get older systems. And it's getting more and more difficult to get than anything really on. So it's getting more and more expensive because they get you know, supply and demand thing. Um, but also they have a, usually on their dashboard it tells them their helium level. So they usually have a, a warning. To know kind of where they're at ahead of time. And hopefully it doesn't get to the point where they're like, oh my gosh, our healing about to run out. You know, it's usually they have plenty of warning, but it's kind of like anything else. You know, it's like when they when you go into work on something, you know, oh yeah, by the way, I got that on the floor. And then it stopped working out that way. I can tell you that part before. It's <laughs> broken, you know. Yeah. It, it, it. Well, our our and our techs um, have a there's an app for that. Um that um all the magnets are monitored wirelessly, and if any of the yeah, magnets the levels, yeah, the cryogen levels go down and it goes off on their phone yeah. and tells them, you know, this this magnets have cryogen yeah, problems. No excuse for it. Oh, oh yes, yeah, so you can't find that. Like, what's that? It sends out a mass text or something. Right? Yeah, yeah, it sends out facilities, the the biomed sends it to our MR guys, so that everyone's well aware of it. Yeah, this, this I can tell you what it's they're not under contract, it's very expensive, you know, bill. Yeah. I had to get one that ran out of contract and had to call them and get a bill that was I want to say twenty, twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, that sounds all right. Your video or that. Yeah, so I don't um think we're coming up close to the end of our time here. So any other questions, comments, or any yep.
Thank <laughs> you. 